Why am I clapping? Hmm? To sync up the cameras. There you go. Thanks. Jackson Bagley, and this is the high school that I went to, Princess Anne. Founded in 1953, Princess Anne stands as one of the oldest schools in Virginia Beach. Throughout its years open, PA has introduced a multitude of educational curricula, such as a myriad of advanced placement and honor courses, various special education programs, and a long history of NJROTC. Not only that, PA was one of the first schools in all of Hampton Roads to introduce the International Bachelorette Diploma. That's a hard word to say. Which makes it one of the central hubs in Virginia for international students. But I don't care about any of that. I care about the teachers. My name's Angie Cosmano and I teach AP Government and Economics. My name is Christina Burney. For the past six years I've taught AP Psychology and World History 1. My name is Chris Jackson and I teach World History 1 and also AP Human Geography. My name is Susie Davis and I teach Advanced Placement European History and Virginia United States History. Betsy DiGiulio and I teach art at Princess Anne High School. I teach a foundations course, a drawing, painting, and printmaking intermediate course, and advanced art in AP Studio. My name is John Casamano and I teach biology and chemistry. One thing I always wonder about teachers is why they want to become a teacher. I mean, the wages are notorious for being way too low, you work long hours to the point where you have to bring your work home with you, and besides, teenagers can be real buttholes. What influenced you to become a teacher? I don't know for sure except that my dad was a teacher. My parents, probably, because they're both teachers. Um, so when I was little, I would set out all my stuffed animals and read them books and dress up. And I was definitely that kid that had, you know, all the animals lined up and uh, loved playing school. Both my parents were teachers and so people always get really offended when I say, or I think my mom might get really offended, when I say that like my mom is not the reason that I'm a teacher, my mom didn't, I don't think, inspired me to be a teacher. Uh, she let me know that a good teacher can have an impact on students and she let me know that being a teacher is something that you could love, so I appreciate her for that, but I got a long-term sub job on a, I took a year off of college, came back, and I, one of the things I did was long-term subbing. And when I got to teach the class, the same kids, I got to teach the same kids for like four weeks in a row in 12th grade core English and 9th grade inclusion English. And like just the connection that I felt with them after those like three weeks, I was like, oh, that's why people want to be a teacher. But I had started subbing um, as a college student. Over the years of subbing, I'd done a couple long-term sub positions, you know, as a college kid, and then the kids that I had, the first group of kids that I had for a long time, um, which was a month, as sixth grader, were starting their eighth grade year, and I was like, oh, I'm gonna miss it. And then it dawned on me that, like, why did I care? Um, and that's when I kind of realized, like, okay, like, this has affected me more than I realized. But I think really what influenced me to be a teacher are the, my elementary school teachers. They were really they were really cool, sweet, rocking it. And education was so different back then, so it wasn't as stressful for um, to meet the needs of you know to meet the deadlines or to meet SOL or something like some things like that. So I really felt I think it's really just my elementary school teachers. They were just so loving and kind and fun. I eventually, every time I went and did something else, I always would come back to education and then I realized it was more fulfilling than working on magazines, even if that was more maybe fun to me at the time. I wasn't like personally fulfilled doing that. Since most of the teachers I interviewed already had a family past of teaching, I started thinking about if they wanted to try to pursue a career before they landed on being a teacher. Was teaching your first choice as a job or is there anything else you considered doing? Um, again, teaching was my first choice for a, a really long time. And then I was all of a sudden, I think I just had like a panic, like, oh my gosh, I'm graduating college. I'm, this means I'm gonna spend the rest of my life teaching. Is this really what I wanna do? And I was like, but I'm really interested in designing magazines. So then I was like, okay, I'm gonna just stop Ed and <laughs> move to Atlanta and go to art school. And so I did that and then I moved to New York and when the economy went down the tubes, which probably wasn't a good idea. Um, but now that I'm teaching, I realize that that's probably what I should have just done from the beginning. Not that I regret going to art school, because it was like a totally awesome time. <laughs> and I'm glad that I did it, that I had that kind of panic attack, because maybe I wouldn't have been as happy teaching just right out of college. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I never want I need to do anything else other than own a restaurant. That's the only other thing I would do in my life if I could. I had like thousands of jobs, seriously. Like I'm like all jack of all trades. Master of none. Um, I sold cars. I was in the United States Air Force. I was a paper girl. Okay, that wasn't recent. That was I was I was 13. I picked night crawlers. I was a disc jockey. I did a little stand-up comedy until the one day when people didn't laugh anymore. And then I stopped. You know, as you get older, you realize nothing's perfect. Um, as much as you, when you're younger, you try to find that perfect job. Um, and so it's just what really does matter to you. And for me, teaching gives me the the feedback I need to make it feel worthwhile. Um, I fought it. Okay. Um, you know, I had that skill set, you know, teach uh, administrators and other teachers were like, you know, you just need to get your teaching license. I actually uttered the words, I'm not crazy enough to do this job full time. For someone who is my absolute best friend, I don't even know what her title was, but she was the art gallery manager slash curator. And she really turned me on to the whole field of museum education. And I just thought that sounded like the best thing ever. And so I abandoned my plans to pursue a PhD and just went straight into museums and had about a 15 year career in museums and loved it. Loved every minute of it. You mean like astronaut was my first choice when well, I was five? No, not like uh, in real life? Yeah. Well, the answer is no. The answer is no. I, I wanted to be a CPA when I was into math when I was in like eighth grade. And then I, that was, that's awful. And then I wanted to be an engineer and then I took basic technical drawing. That was awful. Then I wanted to be a physical therapist. I wanted to do that for a while. I think when I went to college, I wanted to be a physical therapist. Then when I got into college, I think I, I wanted to be a doctor. And then when I realized how much I hated going to school and didn't want to go to med school for four years, that's and then I essentially dropped out of college, went home, and that's when I actually had the... Um, long-term subbing experience so it really took me all I took a real weird backwards path to being a teacher so no it was certainly not my it wasn't the first thing that I thought I wanted to do so as you saw most of the teachers took a very long time and path to find the job that they love one does not simply become a teacher some might say not me though but let's go back a bit further and find out what they were like in high school I was a good student I was um, I had to, was one of those type type of kids that had to work really hard to get her grade to get grades. I uh, was not a good test taker, still not a good test taker. But I also worked in high school and I worked a long a lot of hours, so I was school ended up not being a priority by the time I was done with school. But I was more of a social kid than an academic. I was pretty nerdy. Um, <laughs> Uh, not super nerdy. Like I did SCA. I was on executive council, but I was like, I was definitely like a goody goody kid. I was, I was a good student. Um, I was actually an IB student at PA, but I was not your stereotypical IB student. I was the one who realized very early on that I was not crazy, neurotic, obsessive, straight A OCD kid. Um, I was very content with my B average and doing enough. Um, to get by. I was a really good student and I have to be honest that's one of my biggest challenges as a teacher is understanding students who don't care about school but I was a perfectionist I guess maybe more of a high achiever than a perfectionist I have issues with perfectionism. I was, I was lazy I think is probably the best word I, at least I knew what I needed to do to get all A's and then I just said to myself I don't want to do all that so I didn't I graduated like a 3-5 because I got like half A's, half B's. And I could have gotten A's in those classes that I got B's in, but it was just not work at that age that I was willing to put in. Okay, so some of them were really lazy and some of them were kind of nerdy. It looks like teachers come from all walks of life. Is that good? Yeah. Was that corny at all or was it okay? No, it's fine. Are you sure? Do you think we should do it again? Whether you realize it or not, life is just a big string of events that can be categorized into good or bad moments. So, I wanted to ask all of the teachers, what are their best moments? I don't know if there's a best moment, but I think anytime they, some students make connections outside of class and bring it in. You know, when a student has a breakthrough, when you see that they have um, grasped a confluence of really challenging material and fed it to you through their own filtered lens. Um, I think that's the best and it happens a lot. It just feels so good. 
to know that they've taken something that you've taught them and made it their own and were highly successful at it. Probably one of those like moments that really stand out was my first year teaching. Um, I was working part-time at PA and part-time at Green Run. So not only was it, you know, mainly freshmen, but a little rougher group. It was just, it was a normal day, beginning of class. Um, had given them a little warm-up assignment and started doing attendance. And as I'm clicking, you know, the computer to, you know, mark all the kids' apps and I like look up and they're all working. And it was just one of those like, okay, like I can do this kind of moments. And I mean, it wasn't anything big. It was just that simple of, I gave them directions, they're doing it, and I'm getting paid for this. Wow, this is really great, you know. When my first year teacher and playing game, and then I thought they weren't paying, they like didn't know what was happening, weren't paying attention, hadn't learned anything, I was like, oh, this is a disaster. But then they started actually using, bringing in stuff that I hadn't told them, and I was like, oh, you've got it, you've got it. You're making me so proud right now. And they didn't really even understand why, but. <laughs> I think my favorite moment of being a teacher is like the end of graduation when I get to see the kids come out and they've graduated. Even kids that I didn't even know that well, for some reason just a very happy, happy moment. You feel like you've accomplished something. I had these kids and they watched uh, this documentary called A Live Day Home From Iraq and they, I mean, and we're talking some thugs, thug life, bawling, bawling, eyeballed, they all bawled, we were in a circle. And afterwards, I didn't let us talk about it. I said, I want, before anyone says anything to each other, I want you to put your thoughts on paper. And they wrote, and they wrote just some amazing things. And I still have them. It makes you feel like you made a difference. And, and that makes you feel really good. And that gets addictive. Um, when I taught earth science, and uh, a kid said, I miss Mr. Lee. Mr. Casamano makes us do work. I think that was one of my other favorite moments when I realized, yeah. Those are some pretty life-changing moments. I mean, those moments make you stop and think, man, it would be great to be a teacher. So, what are some moments that would make you think the exact opposite? My worst moment of teaching is when I've, I've hurt a child's feelings or if my professionalism is challenged for false pretenses. That's the worst part of teaching. Probably when you spend a lot of time planning a lesson, either it doesn't, it doesn't uh, go over well or no one's paying attention and everyone's talking and you're just like standing there and no one's listening and it's just... It's like the opposite of everyone getting it. It's like no one's getting it. <laughs> and it's like, I have a failure. <laughs> when I first started as a sub, I worked at a middle school. It was just, middle schoolers were rough. Um, and my mom uh, actually worked at the middle school where I was subbing um, and I would go down, you know, on my off time and just cry. I mean, I was literally like, they're so mean and I never want to go back. And then at some point it like clicked in my head they're just really hormonal like preteens and it has nothing to do with me and it's just all their own issues and so just not to take it personally and you know kind of that thickening of the skin. Sometimes when I'm standing in front of people teaching that they're just not paying any attention to me at all uh, and or that I'm not doing as well as I could or I know I could be doing but generally the feeling when you're when you like when you're engaged with the students it's like the best thing in the world but sometimes I just stand there and think to myself they want to be somewhere else uh, and I think that is pretty, it's, it saddens me. When you think to yourself, your job right now doesn't matter to these people, it's, it's sad, but it doesn't happen that often. I think the hardest thing and the most um, least gratifying thing about teaching is just some of the paperwork that goes along with it and feeling like there's never enough time to complete one thing. I feel like I'm constantly running around with little piles of things halfway done you know, that you have to do a little bit of a, a pile of grading here and a little pile of grading there. And I just, I think that sort of just wears away at you a little bit around the edges. Paperwork and not being appreciated for your job? Yeah, maybe I don't want to be a teacher anymore. But what I really wanted to know is what teachers thought their kids thought about them. Like, how would a student describe their teacher? Sarcastic, I think is probably the first word they would use. Um, probably sarcastic. Um, so hopefully cool, <laughs> uh, probably too lenient or too nice sometimes. I don't know. I think that kids probably would say that I was maybe out there insane, but 
it would be hard to sleep in my class because I'm unpredictable. You know, when students give you compliments, it's the greatest thing ever. And, you know, students have said high energy, and I think that's for sure. My engine idles sort of high all the time. Um, creative, compassionate. Maybe funny, if they find my sarcasm funny. If not, mean. They, a lot of them think I'm mean. Well, it depends on which student you would ask. I would think some would really, most of them would probably say that I care a lot about them, that, um, that I teach. I have a student actually today tell me that she said, you actually teach. Well, ideally a student who likes me, and not that they all do, but the ones that do um, would say outgoing, goofy, um, passionate. Uh, I really try to be understanding. On the negative side, perhaps scatterbrained, uh, a little too lax at times. Being a teacher is a very stressful job. There are so many things that you have to deal with on a daily basis that I'm more than positive that things can get very, very frustrating. The most frustrating thing about being a teacher, I think, is a lot of times, if you're like being rough, hearing people complain, a lot of times people complain, hearing other teachers complain, I find to be a bad part of the job. Um, not being compensated as well as I would like to be compensated is a bad part of the job, but you could say that about a lot of things. I mean, I worked at Schlotzky's. I thought I should have got paid more than $6 an hour before that was minimum wage, but I didn't. Um, I think the hardest part is trying to deal with everyone's expectations, and a lot of times they can be quite unrealistic. You know, um, students expect you to be super entertaining and always in a good mood while at the same time teaching you exactly everything that they need to know without them having to do any work on their part. Right now in my career, the most frustrating thing is um, data. Having to keep track of data or having to jump through hoops to prove that you're a good teacher or to answer to people that maybe not are not in the trenches. That's probably the most frustrating thing right now. I know every teacher probably says this like all the time, but I don't like paperwork. I feel like there is a lot of paperwork that sometimes you're doing, like you're filling out a piece of paper and you're thinking, is anyone really looking at this? That harkens back to all the paperwork and to the, um, to the shortened opportunities to get things done in big chunks. I don't know, just sort of the culture of education is kind of like pessimistic almost and that that's kind of frustrating there's just a whole bunch of bureaucratic crap that goes on that it's just like oh my gosh just let me teach but they want you to teach different ways and it's like but that doesn't really work it's like have any of you ever been in a classroom <laughs> like all these rules that you're making up it just you want to do this stuff and it just makes it so much harder with all the other crap that they make you do some you know or parents who expect you to you know cater to every whim of their child when you've got a hundred plus students on your you know through all your classes and it's very difficult to give every individual student individualized attention in the grand scheme of things it is financially impossible for a school to provide all of the things a child needs to become a great student on the current budget that is i asked the teachers what should schools absolutely provide for their students i think they should listen i think they should give them choices the only voice that they have is either their parents because School systems tend to listen to parents because parents have money and parents pay taxes, or they listen to test scores, which is like a really sad way to listen to students. And essentially to find out the needs of the student, whatever that need may be. Maybe that need is extra help, maybe that need is different courses, maybe that need is to not have all these requirements that they have, whatever. But probably listening is the best answer. It depends when in high school, a different age level in high school, there's a different role and a different idea for what teachers should do so as a freshman teacher I take that role very seriously as my job is to transition them from being a preteen into being a young adult. Um, probably offer more classes, different classes, more college-like things. You know if there was more specialized things I think kids don't know what they're interested in or they would do better and if they're more electives or just different like they could take history but maybe get different kinds of histories or different different I don't know, just more options of classes that kids would be more interested in taking. There, there's so much expected of schools because, you know, uh, parents are, not all parents parent the same, and some parents either don't or cannot give 
And so a school really has to be like a community and really look out for that that kid, you know, that maybe needs something. I occasionally, not real often, but occasionally come across a student that I feel fell through the cracks way before I ever got them. And I wish there were some way of targeting those students more effectively. You know, there's no reason a student should be making a D plus in my intermediate class um, or a similar grade in their foundations class. It means that there's something about the way they learn or about the way I teach, um, but I have lots of students that are successful and only a very few that aren't. You know, what should schools provide? I mean, what have schools been asked to provide? I ridiculous amounts of stuff. I mean, if you ever saw Dr. Merrill's uh, PowerPoint slides where he showed the decade breakdown of, you know, in the 1960s, these were the new things that were introduced that schools had to enact. And in the 1970s, you know, and then you have like the, the D.A.R.E. programs coming out and family life gets added in and all these things, you know, No Child Left Behind and then SOLs. And I mean, by the time you get to the 2000 slide, the font, you can barely read it because there's so many things that have been put into what they expect the kids, you know, what they expect schools to provide. I mean, really, school is your primary socialization and parenting mechanism in this country. If schools really are seen as the primary socialization tool and parenting mechanism in America, then do you think they do a good job of preparing kids for their future? I think the schools... They do, like, they try and do their best to give you a general education. I guess if you're doing an ATC or Votech and those types of things that would get you prepared for if you were specifically wanting a career, there should be more of those types of things, too, and I think more kids need to know about those because it seems like if you know that college isn't what you want to do, you could already be, like, steps ahead to go to beauty school or nursing school or whatever. I think kids who want to be prepared are prepared. Um, I think kids who put themselves in the programs that they need to be in. You know, I was an IB student. I felt overly prepared for college. You know, my husband um, was not the academic. He went to Votech um, and, you know, he's making more money than I am now. You know, he doesn't have a college degree, but he learned skills um, that he's been able to translate into a very lucrative, you know, business and career. So I think the programs are there. The problem is, is A, they're very small um, and B, not all kids are aware of them. I think in general, if you took the entire class of this graduating class, probably 60% are ready to be in the real world and the rest need to go find themselves. Not everybody's ready to be a college student at age 18, and I think that's where we, our expectation of that is, is unrealistic. Generally, I would say yes. I think the most important skills are writing. I think a lot of people aren't good enough at writing. I think another important skill is public speaking. I think a lot of them aren't good at public speaking. They don't gain the confidence in high school where they should. I think those are two things that should be focused on. Well, I think there's a huge emphasis on college, and I, th I think it's wrong. I, I know that maybe this is crazy, but I don't think everybody should go to college. I think it's okay not to go to college. If this person doesn't want to go to college, isn't that okay? Can't we, like, uh, emphasize and maybe accentuate more like a VOTEC thing where that becomes a, like a larger program because learning a trade there's nothing wrong with that it's pretty amazing actually in general yes kids are prepared for their future but most of the teachers stress that college doesn't have to be the only option there are an overabundance of things that kids can go out and do that they don't have to go to college for now for my last question i wanted to know what teaching meant to them hmm. teaching teaching for me is a joy um for me it's a chance to interact with the future it makes me feel like in some small way that I get to live forever or will not. I think making students better people. I think ha like having students grow. Teaching is sort of where everything comes together for me. It's where my spiritual beliefs, my ethical beliefs, my training kind of all comes together and is filtered through the kinds of challenges I design for my students. I guess teaching now for me is like my whole life. It's like everything that you do all day long. Like 
I mean, I spent like all day on Facebook with kids trying to plan out what they're doing for their stupid projects tomorrow that they've waited to the last second to do, even though they have the entire, the whole year for this project. So um, it just consumes you and you want ever, all the kids to do really well and everything and you start, you get just really involved with them and attached to them. And You know, when um, my students get excited about something that I'm teaching and they get excited and I'm excited, that's like a thousand birthdays. I think it's about getting from point A to point B and that not really getting to point B. I think getting to point B is overrated. I think that's what it's all about when it comes to test scores and things like that. But I think that journey in there, that's what teaching is about. Like what effect can you have on a student sitting in that room that makes them a better person? Or when they're done with your class, like what effect did that have on them? It's not just a job. It's never just, it's never been just a job.